Glory to Jesus Christ. Welcome back. You are listening to The Voice of Reason. And today's episode is going to be a very happy episode for me. A very, very happy episode because I get to respond to somebody who's good. Um, I have a brand new favorite patron. My favorite patron, his name is Alex, like me. Um, he's my favorite patron now because he actually sent me a great video, a video that I really liked that he asked me to respond to. Now, I love all of my patrons, but as some of you know, some of my patrons, they send me some interesting characters to respond to, and um, that makes me feel like I'm going crazy. So it's nice to actually get to finally respond to somebody that I actually really like, really appreciate, and really respect, and that is none other than my good friend, Mike, known on TikTok as True Christian Ministry. So Alex, my friend, I want to thank you for asking me to review a video from my friend Mike. I'm very excited to review this. So let's see what my good friend Mike has to say. So let's talk about a little bit of crazy history, shall we? We all know about Martin Luther, but how many of you know about Jan Hus? Jan Hus was born in 1370 and he died July 6th, 1415, which is 100 years prior to the Protestant Reformation. Now you can go look him up, but I'll just share a little bit about him. So he existed during a time when the Roman Catholic Church was extremely divided. I'm talking about more than one Pope at the same time. This is actually not true. When people say that in the 15th century, there was this situation in, wh in which there were three Popes at the same time, that's actually not true. There were not three Popes at the same time. There was actually only one Pope, one true valid Pope, and then there were two other guys that were claiming to be the Pope, but they were not the Pope. They were both anti-Popes. So that's a big misconception in history that, uh, that a lot of people think that there were three valid Popes. No, there has always only ever been one valid Pope at one time. And any other uh, Popes that claim to be the Pope that weren't really the Pope, that's what we call anti-Popes. So this episode of history here that Mike is referring to is an episode of history where there was one Pope and two anti-popes all at the same time. And that was, of course, um, Pope Urban VI, uh, who was actually one of the worst popes that we've ever had. Um, he was such a bad pope that he caused the cardinals to actually elect somebody else to be the pope, even though the cardinals didn't have the authority to do that. And uh, they elected anti-pope Clement VII, and both Pope Urban VI and anti-pope Clement VII each had a few successors uh, over the course of quite a few decades. Um, and then eventually, um, there, because of the conflict of there being uh, the true Pope and the anti-Pope, um, some of the Cardinals thought that it would be smart to get together to elect a third guy to be the Pope to get rid of the other two Popes. But that didn't work either. That just created a second anti-Pope. And that was anti-Pope John XXIII. So Pope Urban VI and his successors were always the true valid Popes. Pope Clement VII and his successors were not. They were anti-popes. And then John XXIII at that time was also an anti-pope. Not to be confused with the real Pope John XXIII, who was uh, the Pope who opened uh, the, first, the Second Vatican Council. But anyway, the more you know, it's good. So um, let's hear more about uh, what Mike has to say about this very interesting time in church history. And if you don't know anything about papal history, you should take a look at it. It's pretty wild. There was one pope that dug up the previous pope because there was a rivalry between the two. So even though the previous pope died, he still wanted to get out his grudge. So he had the body dug up, dressed up like the pope, put on trial, grown men, bishops of God, supposedly, standing in a room to hold trial on a dead body. And then they punished the dead body. Okay, so this is 100% true. Everything he said is true, except right there at the end when he said that the bishops that were there, the you know, grown men, bishops of God, supposedly, that were participating in this, it kind of makes it seem like they were all like in agreement with what was going on. They actually weren't. All of the bishops that were there that were summoned by the Pope for this event, uh, they were unwilling to participate, and they, they participated against their own will uh, just because they were afraid that the Pope was going to do something to them uh, and hurt them so they were all unwilling and that's actually proven with how this story ends but before I get to that um, let's talk about what it is that Mike is, is speaking of here he's actually talking about uh, Pope Stephen the sixth so uh, Pope Stephen the sixth was the Pope in the year 896 he had a very short pontificate 
his pontificate was like not even a year long. He was Pope from 896 to 897. Um, this is true. Pope Stephen VI actually dug up the body of the previous Pope who had just died, Pope uh, Formosus. He dug up Pope Formosus' body, uh, put him on trial, uh, condemned him as a heretic, and then uh, the body was shackled to weights and it was thrown in the river. Crazy stories. So why did this happen? Well, it's kind of a long story, but uh, basically this happened at a time when uh, the Pope was not only just an ecclesial authority, but he was actually a civil authority. Uh, because we need to remember that during this time, and actually going all the way back to the late 4th century, there was no separation of church and state. Um, church and state were distinct, but they were not separate from one another. They went hand in hand, they worked together. And what that means is that the Pope, as the head of the church, he worked hand in hand with the emperor, who was the head of the state, um, and uh, they worked together. So the Pope, during this time, was indeed a bona fide politician. So what that means is that whenever a pope would die and the new pope had to be uh, elected, um, there was actually political rivalries within the church that all wanted their guy, that were all pushing for their guy to become the pope. Uh, not for matters of the faith, not for church reasons, but for civil reasons, because the pope had actual civil authority. They wanted a good guy, somebody that they thought would be a strong leader to become the pope. Well, there was uh, two rival political factions within the church. Uh, and one faction was the faction of Pope uh, Formosus, and the other faction was the faction of the guy who would become Pope Stephen VI. Um, pope Formosus won, and he became the pope. Um, he won the papacy. He was elected to the papacy. He became the pope, um, winning over uh, the, uh, the guy who would later become Pope Stephen VI, but when that pope died, then Stephen VI was elected to become pope. And Stephen VI didn't like some of the decisions that Pope Formosus uh, was making, uh, like civil decisions. So Pope Stephen VI thought that it would be a good idea to uh, dig up his body so that he could uh, put the previous pope on trial and declare him uh, uh, as being a heretic. Because if a pope was uh, condemned as being a heretic, all of his uh, civil uh, decisions that he would make uh, could be overturned. It was like a really weird part of canon law. But uh, so Stephen the Sixth, Stephen the Sixth could have just said, "Hey, I declare that my predecessor was uh, uh, a heretic," which means that his uh, everything that he did uh, civilly is null and void, and I'm gonna replace it with this. He could have done that, but no, he went all out and he dug up the guy's body. He dug up Pope uh, Formosus' body, right? Well, after they had this sham of a trial, which again, the uh, Roman bishops that were there, they were not for it. They were participating, but unwillingly, they were all scared for their lives. They participated and it ended with the corpse of Pope uh, Formosus being thrown into the river. Now, there's actually a happy ending to the story, which is crazy. Um, that, so the, the corpse of the Pope actually washed up at a convent. So it was a group of nuns that found the corpse of the Pope. They, they found his corpse and they recognized him because he had literally only been dead for like a month. He was only dead for like a month when this happened. They recognized him and they buried him there in the, uh, in the cob then just off of like this, the, the, the shore of Italy. They buried him there and then a whole bunch of miracles started happening which were attributed uh, to uh, him being buried there. And uh, one of the miracles that happened is that Pope Stephen VI, this evil pope that committed this act that Mike just described, he was actually deposed. The, the people in Rome, you know, the bishops and the laity, they realized that, you know, they, should, they shouldn't have let, you know, Pope Stephen VI do what he did. So they actually deposed him. They ran him out of town and, uh, and they uh, actually elected a, a new pope. And Stephen VI, um, when, you know, when he was uh, uh, deposed, uh, he actually had a violent end to his life. He was actually strangled to death. So Pope Stephen VI was definitely a bad guy. Uh, the Roman bishops that were there at this famous cadaver synod, they didn't want to be there. They weren't, you know, they weren't uh, in agreement with what was going on. And uh, Pope Formosus did have a good Christian burial. And there were many miracles that were attributed uh, uh, at his gravesite, um, at that convent. Yeah, crazy crazy part about church history but anyway let's keep going and i mean i don't know if you know this but pope urban back when he announced the crusades actually offered 
complete remission of sins to anyone that would die for Rome. Yeah, I'll put it on screen here for you. You want to talk about a heresy. Hey, listen, I'm not just talking to believers. Anyone that's willing to go fight in this army and die in this army, you become a soldier for God in the sense that no matter what, you get complete remission of your sins. Wait, that's, that's actually inaccurate. That's actually not true. So, um, yes, Pope Urban did indeed uh, say that anybody that went to fight in the Crusades that uh, they could receive a plenary indulgence, but we have to understand what that means. An indulgence, a plenary indulgence, just means that all of the uh, temporal justice that is owed to you, uh, that still has to be served to you for uh, the sins that you've committed that have already been forgiven in the sacrament of, con of confession, a plenary indulgence just removes all of the uh, temporal uh, guilt or temporal punishment that would be owed to you. Because the scripture, you know, so Mike says that this is a heresy, but it's actually not a heresy because scripture actually says, for example, like in 2 Corinthians 5.10, I think, it, uh, I think um, it says, and also all over the gospel and in the book of Revelation, it says that God is going to repay each and every single man for what he does in the body. So what a um, indulgence is, it is a remission of that uh, guilt uh, that would have to be repaid for the sins uh, that you committed that have already been forgiven in the sacrament of confession. So, Mike, the way that he explained it here, he kind of made it seem like anybody, as long as you were part of the, uh, of the army that went to go fight in the Crusades, even if you weren't even a member of the church, if you went and you died, you're going straight to heaven. That's not how it worked. Um, if you know about Crusade history, you'll know that a lot of the Crusaders were actually excommunicated by the Pope because they were being disobedient to the Pope, being disobedient to their superiors um, in these armies. And the Pope had to excommunicate actually a lot of the crusaders. And those crusaders that were excommunicated, obviously because they were excommunicated, they were not eligible to receive uh, the indulgence anymore. So the indulgence was only for people that were in a state of grace. You have to be in a state of grace um, and, and you have to uh, not commit sin. Um, and what all it means is that if you die, you go straight to heaven without the need uh, of purgatory. That's all it means. It doesn't mean that you can be a terrible, awful, despicable sinner. And if you end up dying, you know, in the crusades, fighting for the church, it, it doesn't mean that you're going to go to heaven. Um, and also, again, my calling this a heresy, again, scripture says, Jesus himself says that the greatest act of love is to lay your life down for, uh, for your friend, for someone that you love, right? Well, uh, the, what were the Crusades? The Crusades were Catholics going to defend the Orthodox Christians that they were no longer in communion with because the Crusades uh, started 50 years after the split between East and West. The Catholics went to go help the Eastern Orthodox to defend the Eastern Orthodox from the Muslim invaders. They went to go help the Orthodox fight off the Muslims. So Catholics going to help defend Christians that they're not cool with anymore to fight off the Muslims, and a lot of Catholics died defending Orthodox. So Jesus himself says that there's no greater act of love than to die for uh, your friends, to die for those that you love. What about dying for those that you're actually not even in communion with anymore? So there is honor in that. There is uh, something very good and holy about that, that the Catholics came to their defense and they helped them, and a lot of Catholics died they ended up dying fighting off the muslims and if they died and they were in a state of grace and they had not committed sin since their last confession that means that they get to go straight to heaven without the need of purgatory and that's all it means so <clears throat> indulgences need to be properly understood well let's keep going the same papacy that had a 12 year old at one point as the pope pope benedict the ninth Actually, Pope Benedict the Ninth was not 12 when he was elected. He was 20. He was a fully grown man. That's another big myth. A lot of people think that Benedict the Ninth, they'll say that he was either 9 years old or he was 11 years old or he was 12 years old when he was elected. He was actually 20 years old when he was elected. So anyway, Benedict the Ninth was another terrible, terrible pope. Which, may I say, with Benedict, it also led to there being three popes at one time. But that's neither here nor there. So really quick. Neither here nor there, but this is actually true. This is actually a much more fascinating case than uh, the original one that he had brought up. So there were two different times in history where there were three people claiming to be the Pope. 
the one that everyone always thinks of is known as the uh, the Western Schism or the Papal Schism. That one, that one's very overrated. It was clear the entire time who was the true Pope, Pope Urban the Sixth, and the people that the popes that succeeded him. Those were the true popes. So that's overrated. Like you know, again, you knew who the true Pope was the entire time. But what he's referring to here with Benedict the Ninth in the eleventh uh, century, that one is actually a much more confusing case, and that's one where there were three popes at the same time, and you really weren't sure who was the true pope. That's actually a much more fascinating case than the, the Western Schism, which is a lot more famous. Um, but anyway, just wanted to throw it out there. We're talking about Jan Hus. Jan this Hus. is the kind of nonsense that Hus was like, that's, that's not Christ-like. We can go to Matthew chapter 5 and 6 and look at how he tells us to respond to people. Romans 12, Paul tells us to love our enemies, pray for our enemies, to not take vengeance. I mean, Hus has a point here. And then on top of that, he had a problem with indulgences. I love what Luther says later when he ends up saying, if the Pope has the ability to empty out purgatory, why wouldn't he do it? The love of Christ is to give freely. So this right here actually shows that Luther and, and Jan Hus that neither of them actually had the correct understanding of, of indulgences either, because no, the Pope does not have the authority to empty out purgatory, so to speak. The Pope can't just say, I declare that all of the souls in purgatory uh, are let out of purgatory now and they can enter the beatific vision now. That's not true. That is the claim that Jan Hus said that Martin Luther would later, you know, uh, repeat a hundred years later. Um, but it just shows that neither of them actually understood the situation. The Pope can't free souls from purgatory. The Pope can only set the, uh, the guidelines and the standards for people who are alive uh, to be able to receive uh, plenary indulgences or even partial indulgences. So the Pope can't make you do any of those things. Um, you're the one that has to decide to do them yourself. But if you do them, you earn that indulgence. That indulgence does indeed get granted to you. So the Pope can't free anybody from uh, temporal punishment. Uh, the Pope can only tell you that if you do certain things, uh, you can have that temporal punishment removed. So no, the Pope can't, can't free souls from purgatory at will. Who's had a problem with them selling indulgences as well? Now, I don't know the truth behind this, but the myth is that in his church, there was this painting in the background. And on one side, you have the Pope all decked out, got the robes, the gold, riding on the white stallion. And on the other side is Jesus coming in the way of a meek, lowly servant riding on a donkey. People always ask me, at what point did the Catholic Church become corrupt? As if there's this one point. It's not one point. It's money slowly became the God. This is why during a period you could buy the seat of Pope. People were killing each other for that power. Kings were getting involved. You were basically able to buy a government. Because the Pope has power over entire civilizations. He has his own country, basically. It was like having a kingdom but not needing to be born into nobility. You just had to buy it. In case you're not aware, voting for the seat of Pope doesn't begin until like the 13th century, somewhere around there, give or take. It was actually in the 11th century when um, the church created the College of Cardinals. So uh, a cardinal is any bishop that is eligible to vote in a papal conclave, which is a uh, papal conclave is uh, when a pope dies and they need to elect a new pope to be a successor. And they hold a conclave and all cardinals... Um, who again are just bishops who are eligible to vote in these conclaves, they come together and they hold a vote to uh, elect a new pope. And that was established in the 11th century, I think in the year 1059, is when the office of a uh, cardinal was invented for that specific purpose. And uh, it's true that popes were elected or selected or bestowed uh, the office of papacy um, in different ways all throughout the centuries, and the reason for that is because the election of popes or deciding who is going to be a successor of a pope, um, that is something that is uh, pertains strictly to just uh, canon law. Um, it's nothing that pertains to, uh, to doctrine. It's nothing that pertains to like divine revelation. So Jesus uh, did not reveal to the apostles, he didn't reveal to his church um, how papal elections are supposed to happen. Uh, that's not something that uh, Christ revealed to the apostles. That's something that uh, the church had to come up with on its own because it wasn't a matter of the deposit of faith. 
So even in things that aren't matters of the deposit of faith, the church still has the authority to conduct such things in, in any way that they see fit. And those ways can even change. Um, there were times when uh, the popes were elected just by the priests that were there in Rome. All of the priests would get together and they would pick somebody among themselves and that would be the next pope. Um, there are times when it would be just uh, neighboring bishops in Italy that they'd all come together and they would pick amongst themselves who would be the next pope. And then uh, in the Middle Ages, we had, uh, because the pope was very deeply involved in politics around this time, we have the office of the papacy being sold, which did ha and actually that only happened with Pope Benedict IX. He was actually the only one that ever did this, and he did it twice, because Pope Benedict IX was the pope three times, three separate times. Um, he's the only one that ever sold the papacy, so he did that. And then um, there were other means by which people uh, uh, ascended to the throne of, of... And by the way, when selling the, the papacy, that went against canon law even back then. So that was illegal. Um, it, did, it doesn't mean that the people that bought the papacy and became pope by buying their way into it, it doesn't mean that they weren't uh, truly and validly uh, the pope. It just means that the way that they became the pope was illicit because it went again canon law because that's the sin of simony. Um, but yeah, in the Middle Ages, there were all of these strange ways that people would become pope. But it's actually interesting when you look at the, the uh, you know, when you look at history and you look at all of these examples, you see that a lot of these popes that became pope in shady ways, like in really shady ways, they never, ever, ever a single time were able to deface or do anything to injure the teachings of the church. They were never able to change the teachings. They were never able to corrupt the teachings. They were never able to change anything. As a matter of fact, believe it or not, there were some popes who were like terrible, awful persons, but whenever they would like write like papal bulls, you know, papal encyclicals, what we call them now, they were some of the most beautiful uh, works of the magisterium that have ever been produced. Some of the most beautiful works that the magisterium has ever produced were written by popes who were personally, in their private life, really bad people. So that just goes to show how the Holy Spirit really does protect the office of the papacy and how the Holy Spirit does not allow even very evil and corrupt men to corrupt the teachings of the church. Now let's get back to Jan Hus. Now they tried to have a trial with him, but he didn't come and he ended up becoming excommunicated. But the reason why he doesn't want to come is because there's a divide in the church. There's multiple popes. So um, Jan Hus was excommunicated, but he actually wasn't excommunicated by uh, the, the true pope, the valid pope. Remember, uh, Jan Hus lived during the time, during the papal schism when there was two and then three popes. Uh, well, one pope and then one anti-pope and then one pope and two anti-popes all at the same time. Um, Jan Hus was not excommunicated by the true Pope. Jan Hus was actually excommunicated by an anti-Pope. I think it was Alexander V who was one of the anti-Popes that excommunicated Jan Hus. And um, it wasn't enforced because everyone knew that Alexander V wasn't truly the Pope. Um, so you can actually go back in history and you can see that that excommunication nobody took seriously, including Jan Hus. Nobody took it seriously until the, Cons the Council of Constance happened which I'm sure Mike is going to bring up next. But then the king of Germany steps in and solves the Pope issue. The king of Germany forces them to call the Council of Constance. Oh, and by the way, really quick too. So the king of Germany wasn't only the king of Germany. The king of Germany was the Holy Roman Emperor. See, a lot of people don't realize this. They always think that the Roman Emperor is always in Rome. But for the vast majority of the time of the Roman Empire, the Holy Roman Empire, that actually wasn't the case. By the end of the 4th century, the Roman Emperor had moved to the east, to Constantinople. And then actually, by the time of the Holy Roman Empire, the uh, Roman Emperor was actually the King of Germany. So if you were the King of Germany in the uh, Middle Ages, you were the de facto uh, Holy Roman Emperor. That's how it worked. The King of Germany was the Holy Roman Emperor. And a lot of people think that uh, the Roman Emperor was always in Rome. And that just wasn't the case. And it was the king of Germany, the Holy Roman Emperor Sigismund. He was the one that actually was having problems with Jan Hus. Uh, you see, a lot of people think that Jan Hus was um, persecuted over, over strictly just religious issues, but that actually wasn't true. Uh, the religious issues were kind of just used as like an affront. 
by uh, Emperor Sigismund to uh, persecute Jan Hus because Jan Hus was actually leading a, a somewhat of a revolution in Bohemia, which is now known as the Czech Republic. And Bohemia back then, the Czech Republic is right next to, uh, to Germany. And there was tensions between the Bohemians and the Germans. They didn't like each other. There were tensions there. And um, Jan Hus was kind of encouraging uh, the people, the civil authority in Bohemia to kind of rise up against the king of Germany, who was also Holy Roman Emperor uh, Sigmund. So Sigmund was actually kind of persecuting Jan Hus more for political reasons than, than church reasons, even though Jan Hus did have his faults uh, when it came to his theology. Now, in this, they also invited Hus to come and explain why is he saying the things he's saying. Hus was reluctant, but he decided to do it. The reason he decided is because they ensured him safe conduct, guaranteed safe conduct, no matter what the decision might be. And again, that uh, guarantee of safe conduct was given to Jan Hus, not by the church, but by uh, Emperor Sigmund, king of Germany. He was the one that told Jan Hus that he'd have safe, uh, safe conduct, uh, not the church. So uh, that was eventually broken, obviously, which I'm sure Mike is about to mention. Um, but it was broken by the emperor, not by anybody in the church. So Jan Hus went and he showed up to the Council of Constance and he was arrested. He did not receive the safe conduct as promised. He was arrested, imprisoned, and then tried as a heretic. When he refused to recant, he was sentenced to be burned. After they stripped him of his robes, pronounced him to be condemned not only in the flesh but in his spirit, they then told him he had to recant what he was saying and he said he cannot. He was then burned alive after the Council of Constance, after they had their liturgy. Okay, so there's something really, really, really important that my friend Mike here left out. And this is actually really, really important. Um, it turns out that it wasn't the Council of Constance that burned Jan Hus alive. The Council of Constance actually found Jan Hus to be a heretic, and that was it. After the Council of Constance found him to be uh, a heretic, right? And the Council of Constance, you know, the, the bishops there told him over and over, be like, are you sure you want to go through with this? You know, it's going to like, don't do this because you know what they do, you know, to heretics. And they referring to the civil authorities. Um, Jan Hus refused to, uh, to recant uh, his, his beliefs. So the council had no choice but to condemn him as a heretic. But then, after he was condemned as a heretic, he was turned over to the secular courts, to the civil courts, not to the ecclesiastical courts. The ecclesial courts did not uh, order him to be burned alive. The ecclesial courts did not have him burned alive. He was turned over to the secular courts. And guess who was leading it? The king of Germany, Holy Roman Emperor Sigismund. He was the one that had Jan Hus burned alive. As, in fact, as a matter of fact, you can actually go and you can read the Council of Constance and you can actually read where they specifically say that they're going to hand him over to the secular courts, and they do. If you actually go to session 15 of the Council of Constance, which was on July 6th of 1415, uh, it says this. It says, This Holy Synod of Constance seeing that God's church has nothing more that it can do, relinquishes Jan Hus to the judgment of the secular authority and decrees that he is to be relinquished to the secular court. So that's a really, really, really important part that Mike left out. The Council of Constance did not condemn Jan Hus to death. The Council of Constance did not have Jan Hus burned alive. It was the secular courts led by Sigismund who had Jan Hus burned alive. And here's another thing. A lot of people, they believe in the myths that the Catholic Church was killing people for heresy. That's not true. That is just not true. That is one of the biggest myths of history. The Catholic Church never sentenced anyone to death. The Catholic Church never put anyone to death themselves for the crime of heresy. Heretics that were ever put to death were always put to death by the secular courts, not by the ecclesial courts. In fact, it's noted historically, it's well documented that there was always tension between the church and the state because the state was very quick to execute uh, people that were, uh, that were found to be heretics. And the church was actually always fighting with the state, telling them that they didn't want anybody to be put to death over it, that they wanted them to have a chance to 
uh, to see the error in their ways and repent and recant and return to Orthodox Catholic Christianity. That's what the church actually always wanted. You can actually go all the way as far back as St. Augustine in the 5th century. St. Augustine was against the death penalty as a matter of prudence. St. Augustine said, let's not use capital punishment uh, for people that are guilty of uh, ecclesial crimes like heresy. He said, let's give them a chance to think things over so that they can uh, eventually, you know, repent and turn to the true faith. And you can find that going all the way back to St. Augustine. So a lot of Protestants, that like, they like to bring up the, the, uh, the change in the catechism that Pope Francis made, where Pope Francis said that, we are, uh, no that the death penalty is no longer uh, ad admissible, that it's inadmissible. They think that that's an example of Pope Francis like changing doctrine. He's not changing doctrine. Um, he is, it's a prudential matter. He is not saying that the death penalty is immoral. He's not saying that the death penalty is evil. He is saying that the death penalty should not be uh, permitted, that it should not be admissible with the other means that we have today of keeping uh, criminals away from the general population of good civilians. So anyway, um, so again, the Catholic Church has, does not put people to death, right? Did not put people to death even back then in the Middle Ages. It was always the secular civil authorities. The Catholic Church actually tried its best to save people from actually being, uh, from being put to death. And actually, Martin Luther was one of those heretics that was condemned as a heretic, you know, by, you know, by the church. And the church actually didn't want Martin Luther to be uh, put to death. And Martin Luther was actually able to escape, a, uh, able to escape being put to death by actually help of the Catholic Church, which is very ironic. But anyway... That was a really important part that Mike left out, but we're getting towards the end of the video here, so let's see how he's going to wrap up. So after the Roman Catholic Church was divided with three separate people claiming to be the Pope. And only one of them actually being the Pope at one time. The way that it was solved was come together for a council and burn a heretic alive. Oh, actually, so the Council of Constance did solve the, this papal schism. Uh, that was where uh, Pope Martin V uh, became the new pope and all of the other you know all of the other popes uh they stepped down and they said let's all just elect a new pope and they elected pope martin v and he was accepted by everyone involved and the papal schism was was uh fixed and again you go back and you read you read about the papal schism it was clear the entire time who truly was the pope um so martin v is the one that uh, became the pope at the council of constance but that had nothing to do with jan hus that was a separate issue that was more of like a a tertiary issue was Jan Hus. Uh, they were more concerned with ending this bad schism. Um, so no, Jan Hus had nothing to do with uh, the papal schism. And, as, and again, uh, when Jan Hus was excommunicated, he wasn't excommunicated by the true pope. He was excommunicated by the antipope, which means that Jan Hus actually wasn't excommunicated at all because only the true pope can excommunicate you. Um, so, but when he was taken to the Council of Constance, Turns out that he really was a heretic. They turned him over to the civil authorities, as I just read, and they did burn him alive. But anyway, that's unfortunate. I would rather be wrong with my Bible alone than follow that church that did that. Again, a huge, huge, huge mistake here right at the very end. Uh, Mike said that he would rather be wrong with his Bible alone than follow the church that burned Jan Hus to death. The problem is that the church didn't do that. It wasn't the church. It was the civil courts, the secular courts that did it. It was Sigmund, King of Germany, Holy Roman Emperor. It wasn't the Pope. It wasn't an anti-Pope. It wasn't any Catholic bishop. It wasn't the Council of Constance that did it. It was the civil authorities. So, again, a really, really important part of history that got left out. And, and the conclusions that Mike draws from, these, from this is, would, actually be, it would actually be a false conclusion because the church didn't do what he's accusing the church of doing. So this is why it's really, really important that we be deep in history, because the Catholic Church gets blamed a lot for things that it didn't do. And, and just for the sake of being fair, and I know that Mike knows this. Mike, Mike is a super, super smart dude. He really knows this stuff. I'm sure that Mike knows about, like, um, in the Protestant Reformation, there were Protestants that were fighting each other, too. And I'm sure that he knows that uh, John Calvin, uh, he personally burned uh, another protestant that he disagreed with he actually did burn him at the stake and john calvin was the one that did that 
I forget the name of the guy that he did the stake. I'm sure the comment section will help me with that. But uh, Protestants were actually guilty of, of doing the same thing. And in some cases, it was the actual church leaders, not just uh, Protestant civil authorities that were, that were putting people to death. So we have to be fair. We have to look at history uh, accurately. We have to get all of the information because if we don't, we can make mistakes. Again, we can start putting the blame on people at institutions that really don't have any blame. Um, so anyway, I am so happy that I got to watch this video and that I got to react to it because Mike is my favorite Protestant on TikTok. He's uh, amazing the best. He talks about things that I love to talk about, things that I love to like research. I love like medieval papal history because it's so fascinating. I love the history of like the proto-reformers like Jan Hus and John Wycliffe. So my patrons, if you want to be my favorite patron, like how Alex is not my favorite patron, keep sending me more of Mike's videos because Mike makes great videos. And um, anyway, guys, please pray for me. Please pray for my friend Mike. Please pray for the entire Christian church. God bless you. Glory to Jesus Christ.